Well, that's much better. Thank you. All right. Welcome, everyone, to IPFS Berlin Meetup. Um, we're streaming live tonight. Hopefully, there's some people out there watching the great talks. Um, we're going to have about an hour and a half of talks. And we're going to start with David Diaz uh, giving introduction to IPFS and then talk about package management on IPFS. Do we have a link for the streaming? Uh, I believe we have, and uh, it's probably being tweeted right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you don't need yeah, to watch the streaming on this Wi-Fi. Okay, cool. Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you all for coming. Um, uh, it's really a pleasure, and like, I'm really excited to be here today, because like, it's not only the first official meetup in Berlin, it's actually the first official meetup in a spaceship, a real spaceship. Thank you for CBase for hosting us. Um, and it's definitely the right venue to make us think about some problems that will come when we start becoming an interplanetary civilization, right? We have been confined to this single planet for quite some time, and we are really uh, acquainted with the problems that come from delivering our apps and services to like people that live in this planet. But when we start thinking about like how can we deliver the same quality of service to other planets, we might have to rethink the way that we architect our applications. And uh, quite actually, like when we start thinking about those problems, like delivering data to other planets will like, have certain questions when it comes to latency, when it comes to embedded that you can achieve, and those problems are really similar to the ones that we have today when we try to develop the same quality to developing countries, to remote areas. We typically just don't think about them because we are so used to have such quality access to the internet in the countries, in the cities that we live in. So like, have you ever like, questioned yourselves, like what would you have to do in order to like, what would you have to do to your app or service, that if you are an application developer, of course, that will make it like work everywhere, like in every place of the planet? Like, what will have to change? And and that's that's what we, why we are here and like why we are uh, creating uh, IPFS. Um, the way that I structured this presentation, I wasn't given like too much time to talk about IPFS. You will see like very cool demos uh, from all of the speakers. So I will just like give a very condensed overview of what IPFS is and like how it works uh, inside. Uh, and after giving this like very brief overview, uh, so that everyone has like a basic understanding, uh, I will talk about a project of mine called NPM on IPFS. Uh, it's a module that enables you to use um, like install IPFS, uh, install Node.js modules from IPFS. So, okay, talking about motivation and why IPFS started. Um, but first, let's talk about the web. The web is like uh, this platform that we use every day to deliver applications and services to users, and we are users of the web ourselves. We use these applications to acquire more knowledge, to communicate with our loved ones, to run our businesses, like to basically run our lives. Uh, but yet like this this platform that like offers us like these superpowers is actually very fragile. Like we, if we lose the connection to the backbone, boom, like everything is gone. Like all the services that we depend on um, are away as soon as we lose the connection to the backbone. And there is several reasons why it is this way. Um, Definitely not necessarily technical reasons or like technical uh, blockers, but there was decisions made in the past for simplicity that led to the situation where we live today. And most of them boils down uh, or boils up from location addressing. We are very used to the idea of like having a domain and that domain resolves to an IP address and that IP address um, represents a point in the network. And if we are looking for certain content on the network, we contact this central point of authority to tell us what that content uh, is and um, to fetch it from it. So if looking at the network, 
Um, if we are looking for a file, we will identify which machine has the file and we will request, request that file from that machine. Um, this is very simple and might seem totally okay. The problem comes when we have like several people uh, trying to use the same service. So like if I, have to, I want to show, share a photo with you, with everyone in this room, um, I will post it to some centralized service and then like everyone in the room will try to download that picture from that centralized service. And this might seem okay because the picture is like just like this tiny amount of data and we have been doing that every day and we know it's fast again because we are used to this very fast internet that everyone here has access to but like think about when we uh, download the video like if we talk about like a very like seen and small video like the game themselves and if we just make like some very simple calculations of um, how much would it cost for to jump eight hops and do the same request by 30 machines we would use 48 gigabytes um, of bandwidth just to watch this one single video and like we would have to hit the network again and again and again to download to pass the same bytes because the network is not smart enough like the network doesn't know that it already has the bytes it will just do the request again to the same backbone services and just really interesting fact like if we you, you still use the same example Gangnam Style that was uh, seen more than two and a half billion times we have a, a, an effort like a, a workload of more than 500 petabytes on bandwidth alone on the network that we use today uh, and yet we each time we see the video we are seeing the same content and like several people have the content and no one else can see the content to the network you always have to go to the central point of authority um, and that's just because of the way that location addressing works and there are like several other problems uh, um, like that we cannot use the web in disconnected scenarios like we can see today um, the internet of things land like where the web is being completely removed uh, from that space because the web was not designed to work offline, not like the, the caching primitives don't work for IoT devices. Um, and there's like other problems with control, security, permanence, um, that like if you have more questions, I can definitely go more uh, in depth after the talks. So to solve all this comes IPFS, right? Uh, IPFS stands for the Interplanetary System and it's a protocol to upgrade the web. Uh, and when we meet, when we say this, we really mean um, we want to upgrade the web in a way that we don't break uh, compatibility with the user. Uh, if we we know that like if we try to change how the web works, and like if the users have to do different things to use this new protocol that will grant them with the other capabilities, they will just not move because they are so used to use the services that are already there. IPFS is also known to as the distributed web or the permanent web or the Merkel web in honor to Ralph C. Merkel which came up with uh, Merkel links and in, uh, in essence it's like a protocol to make the web work offline um, to make it distributed, to make it permanent, safer, smarter and especially faster because if we don't offer like necessarily a benefit like some improvement that the user can feel and see it's going to be hard to convince them to change. And IPFS is really uh, a collection of great ideas that were already present, especially uh, in the research literature, uh, that were boiled down and condensed together and form IPFS. Um, here's like an image of the IPFS stack. We, we basically cover all of the layers that like an application would have to touch in order to work from network routing, exchange, uh, the data structure that goes into this network, naming and then the applications which is the web. Um, another way to see IPFS is by we have a way to move the data around, which we call the peer-to-peer. -peer. It's like the network layer inside IPFS. We have a way to define the data, which is known as the Merkle DAG or IPLD for those that have been following the latest developments on the IPFS community. And then we have the applications that like just use the data that's being moved around on the um, on top of an IPFS uh, stack. And the core piece of IPFS and like the really huge contribution is this idea of how to define data that lives on the network and that's resolvable on the network. And that core piece is the Merkle DAG. So to explain what a Merkle DAG is, um, let me first ex explain what Merkle links are. So um, a Merkle link is a way to identify some other blob of data that exists on the network by a unique hash, like some unique value that we can always be sure that we are pointing to the right blob. So if I have a link on my next blob, um, 
and I want to point it to the previous blob, I just want to make sure that the hash of that blob is referenced on this new blob. So I can like create a, like a reference always like like a, a, a direction to the other pieces of data by uh, storing the ashes on the, the new elements. And this is what we call the Merkle link. And Merkle links are not new. Uh, Merkle links like were actually uh, like invented and published uh, on 1980. Uh, again, Ralph, Steel Merkel, uh, Ralph Merkel came up with them. And this is the first Merkle tree. Uh, we use them when we are developing applications and we use Git to collaborate. That's also a Merkle tree or Merkle as data structure. Bitcoin, which uh, a lot of us have been talking about, uh, it's also a Merkle as data structure. And there's a ton of other applications that use Merkle as data structures that we use every day. And yeah, so common joke is like, who said like money doesn't really grow on trees, right? Um, and IPFS is this forest of uh, Merkleized data structures. And the really powerful reason uh, why we are doing this is like think about the old uh, early days with uh, CVS or SVN, where like you had several people working on the same data that like and collaborating through the network, but like if there was a, a disconnect from the central server, um, you would basically basically not be able to work anymore on that project. And that the same thing goes like if the server would go down, then like all of the clients would simply not work anymore. But then like appeared Git, which changed completely the 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 story because like. Now now we can like, cut the connections and the computers that are still connected can work together and when they go back online, they can like, just update their status. And like, we can crash whatever we want on a Git system uh, as long as we have some kind of connectivity or that we have access to our local machine where we want to work on, we can use that data that we already fetched. And IPFS is doing that for the entire web. So comparing to the example I was giving earlier, where we would like resolve a domain to an IP, uh, with IPFS we resolve a name, which can be a, a domain name, can be a, an IP nest record, or can be any other kind of naming system that you might want to use. It will be resolved to a hash. And again, looking at the network, this is HTTP land, where we have just this way to contact one single server, which is our central point of authority. With IPFS, anyone can be the point of authority to get this file. Uh, and this is because like, when I fetch the file, like, I identify the machines that have the file, and I fetch them from the network, I have a way to validate that the file that I receive is the one I'm looking for, because I just need to hash it and check if the hash of the file is the one that I w was doing the query in the first place, right? And you might be wondering, okay, like, so what happens if I have really large files? Like, how can I make this efficient by, um, like, not just relying in some other node in a network to, like, transfer me, transfer me something that's really, really large? And the way that we solve it is by, like, chunking the file, and, like, each chunk will now be a separate file that we have get a different hash, so that when we try to get it from the network, we'll just, like, try to get these little pieces from as many clients as uh, we can, which creates like a huge speed bump uh, because we are now transferring the same file but like by several peers instead of like having this one single pipe which is what happens in uh, HTTP. We can have a very complex system behind a single endpoint in HTTP but we are always just transferring through a single pipe to our end client and that doesn't happen with IPFS. And in IPFS, although it's called the interplanetary file system, uh, data is actually structured as um, a, a graph. Like, you don't have to only use files. Files are just like one of the types of things that we can represent, uh, that we can uh, represent on IPFS. Uh, other things can be represented from Git, Bitcoin, key value stores, um, and like basically any data structure that you might want to, to put there. Um, files, again, just an example. Um, you don't have like strictly to, to change your application to think in a way of files. You can just bring your own data structure and host it in IPFS. Uh, which what this gives us, like or what IPFS gives us, is like we can have applications with no origin. Now like any party on the network that's like serving your application can give you the content that you're looking for and you can prove that you have the right thing. Um, 
you can leverage network uh, cache and like you are resilient to network split. So you can like the network can be cut in half, and as long as you are in the half of the network that has the content that you're looking for, you can still resolve it. Um, so like the way to really serve data to everywhere, like to if it's for other planets or for remote locations, is just like really leverage what the network has already available. Just like serve the data from everywhere. Like if the machine, like if I'm posting a picture here and you all want to see it, like I can, my computer should be able to just send the picture to your machine and you should be able to trust that picture that it was the one that I was sending in the first place. Okay, so this was like my very quick introduction to IPFS. There's a lot more. Um, <laughs> there's a little a lot more. Um, we, I could talk like for hours. Um, but I only have 10 minutes and I already spent 14. So next topic, um, which is NPM of IFS, on IPFS, uh, that project I was uh, describing in the beginning. So NPM on IPFS is about putting package managers um, running on top of IPFS and leveraging the distributed properties of IPFS to distribute the software that we are requiring into our own projects. So when we are doing module management, like in, for any kind of language, it's like transversal. There's like always the same set of challenges. We always have to define scope, like what is the module, what can we create that's reusable by others. There's all, always the problems with discoverability, which like historically people like would do web pages, um, I guess like some at least some of you that should be familiar with these old web pages where someone would host a binary of the something that they published. Now there's like way more advanced web pages which not only have the, the project hosted but also like documentation and like the whole community around it. But then like we reach a point where we have like registries, like uh, like community efforts or companies that like just run this uh, centralized point where we can search and identify the package that we want to reuse to for our own code. Um, and it's like the, there is at least one for every language um, available or package managed uh, registers that like uh, just aggregate all of them. Um, then like we need also to solve the problem with transport. Like when we are building this package manager, we have to um, like create a tool that people can use to get the package in the first place, right? Or we can just like do the old like the old days, which is like tell them a URL for them to download or just email a tar tarball, I don't know. Like, there is several flavors there. And then like, one of the big problems when we are doing package management is like, how to, can we deal like, with constant updates? How can we form our users? Like there is packages um, right now, especially in the Node.js community, that like, get so much traffic, get updated so much, uh, that it's really hard for the users like, to really follow and like, what's going on. And each time there is an update, even, even if it's just like one line of code, they have to like, download the entire thing in the way that the current model works. Uh, and again, like, there is like, a lot of updates, a lot of uh, traffic there. Also, there is security updates they have to be able to cope with, and they have to, have to identify which packages exactly have the vulnerabilities. And other problems are like structure. Um, like, in the good old days, when like, everyone agreed that like, a standard library was the best thing, one of the reasons was because like, storage and bandwidth was very expensive. Like, it was not good for you to I don't know, download lib USB every time you, could, you wanted to use USB for your own software. So what they decided was, okay, let's ship this operating system or this language with this collection of libraries that everyone will probably need. Uh, and that was like very beneficial. Like everyone would have like their batteries included when they were developing in a certain language. But that, that also created a lot of problems with dependency hell. And if like if you are used to work with Node.js, uh, one of the things that like NPM, the package manager for Node, solves from the start was that they realize, okay, we are in 2010, we can, like bandwidth right now is very cheap, storage is very cheap, we can install the same module in different versions like thousands of times, and the user will not really complain because he has a lot of storage and a lot of bandwidth, and each module will be able to depend on the specific version that they need. Um, so like adjusting structure and how organize our code is really important for the package manager. There's like integrity, that's as I um, described on the IPFS section, 
like IPFS gives that from for free because you are always checking the content that you receive, and there is the ownership and like who is allowed to run it and update it. So like this set of challenges, like these eight uh, problems, need to be solved for by every package manager. And then like IPFS comes along and like basically solves all of those problems for free. Like it, if you use it uh, to transfer your module around, like you can guarantee that those things will be there. And that's what. Um, we did when we created the registry mirror. Basically, we grabbed the whole NPM registry, all of the NPM ecosystem, and we dropped into IPFS because um, the way that NPM works is just like one more application on top of this web platform that when we lose the connectivity, it's gone. So again, same problem. If I try to update a package or like publish a package, everyone is trying to download it, and like if the connection drops, no one can download, no one can work. And like if you cannot, like you, a huge amount of value is destroyed if we are not able to work just because we cannot install a package when that package might be just in the computer next to us. Uh, and again, I was like with the package right there and I could not see it to the rest of the folks there. So registry mirror, uh, I have a demo and I'm glad that I'm really on time. Um, I have a demo that I recorded because it requires more hardware so uh, I will explain as the demo goes. Uh, so um, what I'm going to do in this demo is basically use IPFS to install packages, like using registry mirror. Right here, I was um, starting an IPFS daemon, um, stand, like standard IPFS daemon, and then I start the registry mirror process. Um, and what I'm going to do when I do this registry mirror daemon, daemon like I cannot stop it from this screen. Okay. Uh, what what happens when I start that process is like it goes to the IPFS network and fetches the latest index of all of the NPM modules that are available. So now I have in my machine an index of like module name, version, and hash. Um, so when I try to install a module, for example, I'm starting big number here, um, and I'm just going to tell like instead of like using the standard uh, NPM registry, use this one that I started here, like just a proxy. When I try to install the module, what, I, what happens is like now registry mirror is fetching that module from the IPFS network. And it works, like of course, like we are like just downloading data from IPFS. But like what is really interesting, so now I'm on another machine, this is actually a VM, but shows the, the point, which is now in another machine, I'm going to again start an IPFS daemon, and both the VM and the host machine are connected to the same router, and I will again download, uh, start registry mirror, get a local copy of the um, NPM registry index, and, and now, after this happens, okay, so now just to really show this working, I'm just like doing a ping, and I'm going to like kill the internet, right? Like I'm going to disconnect, the ping is going to stop. Done, like that's something that you never want to do, right? Um, but now I'm going to install the same module that I just downloaded in the other machine, but because I'm connected to the same local area network, I can install the module. Man, like it was really fast. Actually, like did you know this? Like it was faster than downloading from NPM. Of course, like the module is local in the same machine, the local in the same network. Uh, all it had to do is like to find the other node, uh, ask for that module, and like transmit the blocks. So yeah, uh, whoo, like because. Uh, it's really impressive, and it's very useful if you are traveling and like working in like world connectivity scenarios, and like all your buddies are developers. So probably the code that they have in their machines is the one that you need. And with this and with this demo, uh, I hope that I managed to transmit uh, just like a teen overview of what IPFS is and what it can do. Um, and that's all I got. Thank you. Okay. Cool. Thank you, David. No problem. Who's um, the next speaker? I need to give him yeah. the... I'm next, I think. All right. You can hear me? Yeah, I need that.
So. All right. Um, hi, my name is Samway. I just realized I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning. Um, I'm a software engineer at Protocol Labs, the company behind or working on IPFS. I'm one of the core developers. Um, what I'm doing is basically figuring out a way to do dynamic content on IPFS. And I'm going to show you Orbit, which is a chat application, um, to demonstrate how you can do this stuff. So as you know, IPFS is immune, immutable permanent file system. Every time you change something, it's a different hash. So how in that context can you, can you do stuff? This is the, the basic outline of it. And um, I'm going to do a demo live, I hope, um, to show you how this is. So I've logged into Orbit, the application, and I'm here on this channel. So I can, how do I do that? You, you can see that fine, right? OK, good. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, basically it's like you would expect from, from your chat application. Um, it has all kinds of, you know, basic features of, of chat, emojis, nicknames, um, me, other stuff. But um, that's basically, you know, dynamic content, right? There's new messages coming up and, and so on. Um, Another cool thing I want to show in Orbit is um, basically adding files to it. So I drag and dropped a folder of, of screenshots here, and you can you can preview them and open them. And you see the hash here. Um, you can copy that by pressing the hash button, and you get the IPFS hash. So you can go and do IPFS get, and you get that file, right? Um, but we can do a little better than just showing screenshots. So Here's a, here's a JavaScript module that has um, a bit of code. You open it, and you can see the preview of the file right there um, with nice syntax highlighting and so on. But what I also have here is an index file. And as you can see, it's, uh, the, the JavaScript module in itself oh, is uh, served via IPFS. Uh, you could do this locally, but I, I'm using the gateway just to make sure it works. Um, so this will just output stuff in the log. Um, but when you open it and you open the console, you can see the log here. So basically, you can deploy your applications directly in the chat, and they're linkable in IPFS. So you can basically paste them as a URL in your browser, and that's it. It's the same content. Um, and, and as you can see, it's just the data or the, the content of the file. So another cool thing you can do is adding, obviously, music and, and videos. So it starts playing immediately. Unfortunately, I don't have audio here, but uh, trust me on that. <laughs> uh, and, and you can seek into the thing. And once you open another one, it will start uh, playing automatically. I wish I had audio. But we can also add videos, right? And um, we add a video, you get a preview, and it will start immediately. Um, the video right there in the browser, and you can, or sorry, in the in the chat, and you can also seek the video and so on and so on, make it full screen. So that's pretty much, you know. Um, unfortunately, I don't have anyone chatting with me right here, but you know, as you can see, there's, is there someone? No, there's there's nobody there. Um, anyway, so um, that's. Basically, Orbin. Uh, the, uh, JavaScript application wrapped in Electron to make it a native application. Um, there's a backend called OrbitDB, which is the data structure uh, behind the whole application. And that's using uh, JS IPFS to connect to your local uh, IPFS daemon. Eventually, it'll be IPFS in the browser, I hope. Um, so yeah, it works, you know, just like your 
regular node uh, web application. So how do you do that? Um, OrbitDB is basically a um, key value store and event lock. Um, it puts the database into the clients, not on any server. It's all in, your, in, in the user's uh, clients, and everybody shares the same data. It implements a level up API, and uh, you install it just like you would install any um, JavaScript module. And so you have uh, different kinds of data source, like the event log you add and you get an iterator, uh, put get for key value store and so on. So how it works is that every time you add something there um, in, into the database, we create an operation, database operation, so add, put, del, and so on and so on. And we put this into a log of things. It's basically an append-only uh, linked list of hashes pointing to the previous operation. So add, and then del, add, add, and so on and so on. And then based on that, we can construct the view of the current state of the data in the database. So obviously, you don't need all the million operations to, to have the current state um, necessarily. And how that works, or like how the operation log is, is done, is via IPFS log. This is, a, again, JavaScript module. Um, and um, yeah, like I said, it's a linked list that points always to the hash of the previous one. You can't, yeah, you can't remove entries because you know that doesn't work in the Merkle linking world, as David explained. So th this is basically how it looks. Um, there's the there's the data of the database operation and the pointer to the next entry, and they're all like this and all chained together. Um, the data can be any kind of data. It can be just a string, if you want, um, or something more complicated. You can create your own data types on uh, to to create certain types of indices, if you want. And um, so, putting it kind of all together, um, when you send a message in Orbit, it gets put into IPFS as an object, N not as a file, but as an object. Um, then it gets added to Orbit. It creates a log entry, so the database command, as you saw in the in the JSON. Then we take a snapshot of the log, gives you an IPFS hash, and that gets sent to the PubSub, which is a, a mechanism for um, replicating the the messages into everyone who's on that channel. Um, and from the PubSub, the the subscribers, so the the people in the chat, receive the hash. Then they join that hash, the, the log from that hash with their local one, and the databases get, get merged. And that's all there is to it. Um, so, yeah, we're still using a server for, for the PubSub mechanism. We're working on um, IPFS version of a PubSub. Um, eventually, I want to add encryption. Obviously, nothing is encrypted at the moment, so don't use it for, for anything. <laughs> and access rights, you know, like if you're familiar with IRC, you want to have certain levels of access rights. But if you if you think about it, a lot of applications, a lot of dynamic content is key values and uh, relational databases or event logs or counters or whatnot. And with this kind of approach, you can create a lot of different types of 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 data structures or ways to use uh, data in your application. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, so, yeah, you can do, like, blocks, wiki, email, even video streaming, eventually. Um, and um, there's a mention of CRDTs, but I, I'll, I, I can talk about it later if you, anyone is, is interested in that on detail level. Um, if you're interested, come help us. Um, Orbit, Orbit DB, all the data structures, the log stuff. Um, if that's up in your alley, let let me know, and um, we'll definitely uh, want to have help with that. And also, yeah, tell us your use cases. What kind of content or data structures you're you're putting into your application and wish IPFS had. Um, that helps us to, to provide those kind of tools and primitives for you to, to uh, build those applications. 
Um, yeah, that's it. Come, come join us on IRC, on IPFS, on Freedom. Um, there are the links to the different projects on GitHub. Questions, please come, come and talk to me after the talks if, if there's anything you want to ask um, or contact me otherwise. Thank you. So next up is Alberto from Ascribe who's going to talk about BigChain DB. Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Good. Okay. Can you hear my breath? Okay, wait. Is it better? My mouse stopped working for whatever reason. Keyboard is working, it's enough. <laughs> whatever. Okay. Okay, so hello everyone, and uh, I'm going to talk about BigchainDB, that is a scalable blockchain database, and uh, uh, it's uh, developed by Ascribe. And uh, before we start, a few words about me. My name is Alberto. You can find me on the internet with this handle, BRDE, like on Twitter, GitHub, whatever. Me, personally, I'm really interested into like digital rights, internet freedom, and uh, open source code, political open source code. And uh, it's more than one year I'm working at Ascribe, slash BigchainDB. And I found actually a pretty good match between what I'm doing, uh, on what I'm interested on an ethical level and what I'm doing at work. And this is quite a nice fit for me. One quick um, uh, introduction also about Ascribe.io, that is the service that uh, we're also developing. Uh, basically, Ascribe.io is a service for creators to lock attribution, securely share and trace where work spreads online. So basically, if you create digital content, you can use Ascribe.io as a gateway for the blockchain and timestamp your creations and track how uh, your digital artifact spreads around the, around the internet. Anyway, if we take a step back and uh, we take a look on how the cloud has been till now, uh, if you have like uh, if you want to develop an application uh, on the cloud that is just someone else's computer, you need like a CPU somewhere. You need to borrow like a, um, a virtual machine. And for example, I don't know if you are familiar with Amazon, EC2 is a provider of virtual machines. Then uh, you need storage. You need a place where basically store files that your users might upload. So, and then of course you need a database that is uh, the place where you store structured data. And uh, this is how the cloud has been, in, uh, has been until now, but something happened like a few years ago that is called uh, block, uh, Bitcoin. And uh, Bitcoin is, uh, okay, I think you're almost familiar with Bitcoin, so it's uh, basically decentralized digital cryptocurrency. I like more the definition magic internet money. And uh, yeah, this is the higher resolution image I found on Reddit. Anyway, Bitcoin actually sparked a really, really interesting revolution in, uh, for, for developers because some people start to look at Bitcoin as a database. So not only, uh, not only digital currency, but a database, basically a place where you can store and save data. And uh, it has some really, really interesting properties. For example, it's decentralized. And uh, it's immutable, so if you put something there, it will be there forever. Even if, uh, for example, uh, applications using, using the Bitcoin uh, as a database, they disappear, the data is still there. 
and this is pretty interesting. So I'm putting Ascrape there on top because Ascrape is using, as I, as I said before, uh, the uh, Bitcoin as a database because we are storing data about uh, our about uh, uh, the user users' data. Sorry, we're storing users' data on the Bitcoin blockchain, and um, not only this, but uh, there is also another tiny, tiny problem that is related to the scalability of this blockchain database. So what if we want actually to have something that is planetary scale? We're talking about interplanetary and planetary stuff, and this slide fits quite well. So what happens if we want to create applications using the Bitcoin blockchain as a database? Actually, this is a bit difficult right now because uh, the blockchain is basically a bottle, can be a bottleneck because the uh, Bitcoin blockchain supports an average of, of 1.5 slash 2 transactions per second globally. And if you think about like the average uh, throughput of, I don't know, other networks like uh, uh, MasterCard, they have like two, three, four thousand transactions per second and it's like orders of magnitude more than what you can achieve with the uh, with a Bitcoin blockchain. And um, the other question is, are we able technically to achieve high, really, really high performance? The answer is yes. If we take a step back and we look on what, for example, other companies are doing, like Netflix, they're able to reach more than one million writes per second, just gathering together like a lot of Cassandra instances, the databases, and uh, they were able to achieve like last year uh, this nice result. So basically, they adding just databases okay, to, to their internal network, they were able to achieve one million watts per second. And, uh, oh, 2011 actually, so even five years ago. It's a really, really interesting blog article. You should check it out. Is it planetary scale? Well, Netflix were able to use, was able to use like 37% of the total internet bandwidth of North America in one day. And I think that this is a pretty, pretty huge result. So what can, what can we learn? basically from, from this example. Uh, we can learn on how to scale up the blockchain, that, uh, the, uh, the blockchain uh, as, a, as a database. So for example, there are two ways we can uh, think on how to improve the throughput of the Bitcoin block, of the blockchain, sorry. And one idea is to start from uh, um, the blockchain and add big data uh, characteristic on top of it, so scalability, or another approach is to start from uh, a big data database that we know they scale and add blockchain characteristic on top of it, like scalability, um, because sorry, big data actually uh, it's already, it's ready for scalability challenges. And uh, what we need to add on top of it is like decentralized control and immutability. Uh, we decided to blockchainify big data. So what we are doing, basically, we keep the good characteristic of the big data world, that is scalability. And uh, on top of it, we have decentralization, adding like uh, having like a federation of nodes that are voting on the transactions that are valid and invalid. We're adding immutability, uh, adding the hash of the previous block to the current block, where a block is a container of transactions. And then, of course, you, you need to be able to add the digital, digital assets to it. And... Uh, we decided to go again uh, in this way, so to add uh, blockchain characteristic to big data, and we're using uh, we're leveraging a database called uh, RethinkDB. I don't know if you heard about it. Anyway, it's a really really powerful uh, database, and we decided to add to it the, uh, those blockchain characteristics. This is a really high level overview of the architecture of the, our system. So we use RethinkDB to handle like intra-cluster communication. So what you see from here is like uh, you have some entry nodes uh, and entry nodes for uh, big chain DB on the sides. And all those nodes, they talk to each other using RethinkDB as the uh, intra-cluster communication system. Uh, the big chain nodes are able to accept new transactions via an HTTP RESTful API. And uh, uh, basically what the big chain DB nodes uh, do, they bundle transactions into blocks and they validate the transactions inside the blocks and they vote. 
We uh, also uh, published a white paper that you can find in uh, bigchain.com slash uh, white paper. And this is a result that you can, you can find easily in the, in, the, in the white paper. And we were able to reach um, 1 million writes per second with uh, 32 nodes. In, um, we were basically, yes, we created a, a cluster of, of nodes in uh, using uh, EC2, some EC2 instances, and we were able to achieve this kind of result. That is pretty, pretty interesting. So BigchainDB is a, uh, it's a blockchain database. It has like really, really high throughput, more than one million writes per second, really low, low latency capacity. We borrowed it from the big data world, so it's quite big. Scalability, as I showed before, we're able to scale the system linearly, adding just nodes. To the, uh, to the federation, and uh, query. Since it's a database, you can actually query and extract the data, and this is pretty interesting. So how does it fit BigchainDB in the scenario I showed you before? So if we replace the uh, Bitcoin, um, the Bitcoin uh, blockchain database to the, on the bottom right, we have BigchainDB now that is decentralized. Uh, our plan is to move Ascribe.io, the backend, I mean the, the database backend, from uh, uh, the Bitcoin blockchain to the to BigchainDB. And this is actually pretty interesting. If you close your eyes a second and imagine the future, this can be, the future can be something like that. So we have, uh, using this slide, I show you, this slide I showed you before, for processing you have Ethereum that is basically a way to handle smart contracts and to run uh, codes in a distributed fashion. On the storage level, you have IPFS, and then on the database level, you have BigchainDB. And uh, our plan is also to use uh, IPLD to basically connect BigchainDB to the files in IPFS. And basically, that's all. Questions later. So if you want to know more, you can talk to me, or there are also other people in the engineering team that are happy to answer your questions. Thanks. That's amazing stuff. Um, looking forward to hear more, more details. Um, next up, we have Markus Ligi to talk about IPFS Droid. Um, I guess IPFS on, on Android. You want to put this first? Hello, I'm Ligi, uh, and this will be a short um, talk about IPFS on Android. Um, a little bit of context. I'm an Android developer who really loves decentralization and loves IPFS. The problem is at the moment when you search for Android and IPFS, there is nothing much. But I cannot really wait uh, to use it. Uh, I want to use content addressing. I don't want to talk to servers anymore. Um, and last week, um, here at Hack and Tell in the Seabase, there was Mr. Bennett, and we had a short talk, and he said, um, end of the year, uh, the push for mobile will start, but I think um, we have to do something in the, uh, in the meantime. So um, I'm a Java developer, so I was thinking about we're doing it like kind of dependency injection. So um, we first define the interface and fill it later with a real decentralized uh, application, which we want. Um, but in the meantime, uh, we mediate by just using a centralized service, uh, and this is like IPFS.io. Um, that's doing the same for the web, so um, you can put in a hash and get the content. And um, yeah, so in the meantime, then we can explore some um, like 
use cases and UX patterns on mobile because I think mobile will be really important for um, IPFS and we, we heard that like also in the first talk like um, all the use cases and a lot of them there are mobile and it's really good job you are doing there but we need to push for mobile. So I started last week a little uh, project, um, it's IPFS Droid. Um, the first step in it is um, to just handle um, the IPFS URLs. At the moment, IPFS colon slash slash, IPNS colon slash slash, FS slash slash, IPFS and FS IPNS. Give just a short demo, one second. Ah, the emulator died. One second. So we have some of these uh, URLs, um, static uh, immutable content on IPFS, it's resolving that, and also like IPNS pages, like for, the, uh, for example the IPFS website. Um, the next steps then would be um, to also have a content provider. Like in an Android, that's an option to um, supply data from one app to the other app. Um, and there we have to use content, uh, colon, slash, slash, um, and then IPNS or IPFS. Um, so we can use that from all the apps and later on just exchange it for the real uh, stuff. Um, document provider would also be nice. That's for then picking files from uh, IPFS and an Android library to really make it easy to um, drop in IPFS and don't care for the rest. So that a lot of like adoption in um, applications are coming. Um, yeah, at the moment you can also like cross compile IPFS, um, but there's a problem like with the package manager at the moment, it's not working like with Ethereum because IPFS uh, uses the GX uh, package manager and that's not supported by the cross compile unfortunately, but we can work on that. Um, there are really interesting possible applications with uh, IPFS on Android, like an Decentralized App Store, I think, would be really awesome. Like, because everyone has all the apps on their phones already. Why should we go to a central place like Google and fetch it from there? Map tiles also, because when you all navigated here, why should we all get the map tiles from some central server? You all have them, and we should get them. And I think maps is one thing that should be um, native. Like, that really won't work with, like, who, who's using, like, maps in a web view on his mobile phone? Like, so we need that really native. And um, one thing, one motivation for me, like, I'm working at the SPAS at the moment, and there I also, like, um, need IPFS, but without the keys there. Um, follow up, like we shouldn't have a Q&A here, but I really want to spark the communication. Everyone who wants to talk about IPFS on Android, come afterwards, talk to me, or if you're remote or uh, everything else, like um, drop me an email, uh, yeah, or look at the GitHub repository. That's it, it was just a lightning talk. Have a nice day. That's really, really cool stuff. So. If anyone out there is interested in IPFS on Android, uh, on GitHub, going to talk about IPFS dead drop, which is a weird thing, but it's located here in Seabase, so you can try it out later on if you want. Yeah, can you hear me all right? Okay. Uh, you can see me. Okay. So let's get started. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to Seabase. Um, I'm a member of Seabase, and I will present uh, today our project we've done called the Interplanetary Dead Drop. Um, so, like any good 
drama, uh, my talk will be divided into five parts. So first I'm going to talk about the backstory um, and give you a short outline about the history of Seabase because there's a lot to talk about. Um, then I will show you how to actually use the dead drop so you can try it out later if you want to. Um, and then I'm going to d go into the nitty gritty details of uh, how we build it and how it works and talk about some of the challenges we had and some afterthoughts uh, and in the last part. So let's start with the backstory. So Seabase, well some people say it's a hackerspace, but it's actually a crashed space station. So it crashed your buildings of years ago, but it actually comes from the future. And you may ask how is this possible? And the answer is obviously time loops. And well then you then you ask like is such a thing even possible? Well yes it is. So it all started with this um, device, it's called the Siri Probe, was found in 1995. So you have to imagine Berlin, the wall came down like five years prior and uh, it was all the space that nobody lived in right in the city center, so people dug up things there. And the founding members of Seabase found this device uh, and it's a data backup probe from a space station. Uh, so it's one of several probes that, um, yeah, is used or should should be launched into a stable orbit around Earth uh, in the case that something happens to the space station that you're now sitting in. Um, well, Seabase crashed on Earth, and also the Siri probe crashed here uh, later, we think. Um, so this is the reason why we know that Seabase existed. So, well, it, that oh, will and will exist, yeah, because it's a time loop. Um, the, the people that found Siri originally started poking around and like read out the log uh, from the uh, device and what they found out was that Seabash crashed uh, on Earth approximately 3.5 billion years ago. So right at the time when life got started on Earth. So, go figure. Um, the locks sh but also show that Seabase will be in orbit again. And thus our mission as members of Seabase is to reconstruct the whole station and take off again in the future. So we can complete the time loop and the space and time continuum will not break. And so we have this data probe downstairs, standing around, and we were also inspired by a project of the media artist Aram Bartol called USB Dead Drops. Um, he basically uses simple USB memory sticks and fits them into walls, and you can just go there and put your laptop to the wall and then put files on the USB stick. So we thought like, well, USB Dead Drop plus IPFS because we are the space, the space station, we obviously have a real need for an interplanetary file system um, that will, yeah, it's basically a match made in heaven. So, um, so now I'm going to tell you about how to actually use the dead drop. So it's just like the USB dead drops by Aram Bartol, we go and put files on them, but it also publishes them automatically to IPFS. And what you need is a smartphone that can read a QR code and you need a USB memory stick with the files that you want to publish on. And you go to the device, you put the USB stick in, uh, then you wait until the data is copied, so there's a little progress bar on this main screen, and then you wait uh, until IPFS calculated the hash and you can get the hash as a QR code later. And, well, how did we build this? So, Siri was built by really the people that started Seabase 21 years ago. Um, it was like this thing that was always standing around here as a kind of art piece. Um, it was originally powered by an Amiga 2000, so basically like the technology of that day. Um, with a CRT monitor and like lots of uh, relays connected yeah, in a dangerous, really dangerous way to mains power. So we are 
all took that out. So technology has progressed that we can now use LEDs. And well, we in 2014 and 2015, we basically replaced everything with modern technology. And in 2016, uh, Henry Burgius, who's sitting here, and his colleague, uh, Jun Nutby, um, from the grid, uh, we're already using uh, IPFS, and they suggested like adding that to the, the system. Well, and well, we started doing this here at Seabase, and then uh, the or, or two of the organizers of the Logan CIJ Symposium uh, was a conference in March 2016 that was like made to uh, bring hackers and investigative journalists together. Um, invited us to like work on the thing there um, because we are originally thought that it might be a good idea for people to use this IPFS uh, dead drop to for example leak documents uh, or publish things that people don't want to be published um, but I have some second, second thoughts on that so later I'll tell you a little bit about that so and now how it works so uh, there's a simple uh, UDEF rule, which took a long while to figure out how to write, <laughs> that just starts a simple Python script that copies all the files from the USB stick onto a hard drive. And um, in the process, uh, we publish uh, the, the state of the whole thing as a simple JSON file that is available uh, using an HTTP server on the same device. And we have a simple JavaScript single page UI um, that uh, works uh, by regularly checking this JSON file that the Python script writes and just changes uh, according to what's in the JSON file. Um, so this is how if you ever want to build something that reacts to adding a USB memory stick to it, so this is the the UDEF rule that you need to add uh, to your uh, configuration files on your Linux. And if you wanted to do something else uh, with uh, USB, then this monitoring thing is really nifty and uh, really saved a lot of time for me. So here are a bit of the challenges and thoughts that I want to leave you with. Um, so there, there are some challenges uh, when you want to make something that's running a script but also has a UI. Um, there is no way to tell right now in IPFS how long it will take uh, for me to upload the whole thing. There's no way for me as a script to get the data like a percentage, uh, like how, how long it's going to take. For copying the files, I made this workaround using the Linux uh, DU or Unix utility that basically says how big are the files and how big are the files uh, on the target device. So um, I just compare that. But for IPFS, there's nothing like that. Um, and then there's second thoughts about if you actually want to use this as a secure anonymous dead drop. Um, so, well, everyone, everyone who accesses the things will well, basically broadcast that they've accessed, accessed the thing. So everyone who reads your leaked documents will also be uh, exposed. Um, and of course, as someone who's like uh, afraid of people leaking their documents, you can just like watch on the network if certain hashes appear suddenly, like if you can have access to certain files. So that's why I don't think this is a good idea to uh, uh, leak documents um, and maybe not the right tool for the, for the job. Um, yeah, but if you want to look at the source code, it's really short, uh, look, uh, look at uh, our GitHub repository. Um, yeah. Um, uh, Yun and Henry also started a project called the IPFS ring pin, which deals with how to like get the files onto other servers uh, once they're dropped into our dead drop. And yeah, again, thanks to Yun and Henry for collaborating on the project, and thank you all for your attention. All right. That's it, Noel. Um, thank you for or to all of the speakers. That was fantastic stuff.
Um, a really, really big thank you to Seabase for hosting us tonight. Um, we really, really appreciate that. Also, if you want to have a tour of the spaceship, uh, space station. the space station, sorry, man. <laughs> Henry over here um, will take people around and tour you around the space station. <laughs> Beers first. Um, thank you for everyone watching. Hopefully the stream was good. Um, that's it. Right.